I could probably spend an entire video's worth just talking about what things set apart a bad fan game from a good fan game all the way to a great fan game. Not just for the Toho Project, but for any sort of series. Since we're talking about a specific game today, I'm only going to list out some key points. I can guarantee that when some of you look at this list, you'll be ready to add, remove, or even reword parts of it. But for this video, I think this is more than sufficient. That said, if you have some suggestions, I would love some discussion for when I do make a video on the topic. But today, I am talking about Toho Mistia Izakaya. The title of this video should say plenty about where I put this game, but I'm going to go over why I consider it a great fan game. So just to get it out of the way, what is this game? Toho Mistia Izakaya is a self-described pixel art restaurant simulation game. The gameplay consists of collecting ingredients and recipes, making friends, building your restaurant chain of izakayas, and turning your Mistia into the God Emperor of Hell's Kitchen. When you first open up Mistia Izakaya, you're greeted with an animated intro and original song accompaniment. This intro acts as a condensed showcasing of many important gameplay elements while also giving a glimpse into just how polished this game is. The game is really good at giving a solid first impression, as we'll likewise see in the tutorial. You'll then arrive at the title screen where you can begin your capitalist ventures. But before that, let's talk about the controls. Both controller and keyboard are supported with modifiable primary and secondary inputs. As someone who played with a keyboard, I have to note that while it isn't listed anywhere, your mouse buttons by default can be used for UI accept and cancel inputs, talking, interacting, sprinting, and even rhythm game inputs to name the important ones. I found this to be the best way to play on keyboard, despite no mention of them in the controls tab. Other than that, there's a lot of freedom with the graphic and sound settings. When you start a new game, you are brought to the first part of the tutorial, where you find yourself seemingly at the conclusion of the story. Aside from teaching you some basics of the game, it gives some interesting plot implications that got me invested into the story immediately. And that's something I want to talk about briefly without spoiling anything. The game has a main plot that can be followed at your leisure, which is further expanded in each DLC. The early part of the game will focus on you making money to pay back loans as the plot slowly develops in the background. These loan deadlines are extremely easy to meet, and I found myself consistently making daily profits that could cover an entire loan. I think this is by design as to avoid players soft-locking themselves too far into the game. Aside from this, different plot events may occur, sometimes involving different cooking challenges. As far as the story is concerned, I found it to be suitably light and fitting for the casual vibe the game offers. So now let's talk about the actual gameplay loop. The game flow is broken up into days, each of which are composed of a day portion and a night portion. Both of these portions can be skipped individually each day. During the day, Mistia can collect or purchase ingredients, travel between locations, talk with different characters, and work on various requests. By default, gathering ingredients and changing maps takes increments of time. Ingredients are only found on certain maps, and some only appear at certain times. What does not take time is shopping in stores. There are a variety of stores on different maps, and each sells different ingredients, drinks, and even pre-made foods. Not only do prices of these goods fluctuate, but certain stores sell stock at inflated prices. The further you get into the game, the more you can rely on stores to save time, as money becomes extremely plentiful. You may also spend time with named characters to get them to come to your izakaya that day, or to gather some ingredients for you depending on your friendship level with them. And yeah, that's one of the things you're going to be focusing on during the day portions of the game. Aside from working on the main plot, you're going to want to befriend all the residents of Ginsokyo that you can. Friendship levels go from level 1 to 5. Upon reaching the threshold for a new level, you're given a request to serve them a new dish at your izakaya. This is how you gain new recipes. And if you do the math there, that's a lot of recipes. Likewise, maxing out the friendship of a character also gives you a new costume or an upgrade to either Mistia or your izakaya. Simply talking to a character is enough to raise affection by a little bit, but the vast majority of affection will come from getting good ratings from them when they dine at your izakaya. So now the strategy aspect of the daytime portion of the game starts to become apparent. You have a limited amount of time slots a day, you need to make sure you don't run out of certain ingredients, but you also want to try and talk with different characters. Since traversing different areas takes time, the map is deliberately designed such that each day you need to plan an effective route. What ingredients am I low on? Are there any requests I need to turn in? What shops can I visit in that direction? All these things start to build on each other and make the player strategize each day, but it never feels stressful since you're not on a strict time limit. 
Once the daytime ends, you are prompted to open up your izakaya for the night. From here, you select your location, size, and any assistance you want to bring. New locations and izakaya size upgrades can be unlocked through the main story, DLC, and different quests. Different guests appear at each location, while different sizes allow you to seat more customers and hold more cooking stations. As for your assistants, these are unlocked as you progress through the game and can be set to do different tasks. These involve serving drinks, serving meals, or assisting in cooking. While you can use as many as three at a time, each one takes a percentage of your total profits. So you can either save money by having Mistia do more work, or make things easier and hire help. Each assistant has different things they excel at, while certain ones also have special abilities. Once you're done selecting these things, you're not quite done yet. From here, you can select what you'll put for your cooking stations and your menu for the day. Depending on what size izakaya you have, you may not be able to bring every type of cooking station. While this not only limits what you can actually put on the menu at night, if you are planning to do a quest that involves serving someone a certain dish, make sure that you have that station needed to cook it. Speaking of cooking stations, not only can you upgrade each of them, but you can unlock special versions for purchase. And now once all that has been selected, you will finally be able to begin the izakaya portion for the day. Unlike the morning portion, gameplay is done in real time. Guests will take their seat, order food and drinks from the menu, and hopefully leave happy. If you take too long with an order or give them something incorrect, the guests will leave unhappy. Guests may also order multiple times in a row before leaving until they're satisfied or run out of money. If all tables are taken and a new guest arrives, they will get in line to be seated. Once the time runs out for that night, anyone not seated will leave. Anyone who is already seated will continue to order and eat until they decide to leave. While regular guests will order directly off the menu, special guests such as named Toho characters will instead ask for foods with certain traits. And this is where most of the strategy and complexity comes into the izakaya portion of the game. Each character has dishes and drinks they like, as well as types of dishes they do not like. As you discover character tastes, your journal entry for that character will be updated to include that information. Because of that, your journal ends up becoming crucial for doing well in the izakaya portion. Out of a character's list of liked foods and drink traits, they will ask for one trait of each. While making them food that satisfies multiple of these traits increases your potential rating, giving them the exact trait that they ask for is worth more. Coming up with creative food and drink solutions for customers turns into a bit of a puzzle. Sometimes Cherno asks for a cool dish, but you also know that she likes sweet dishes, so I may give her a peach tapioca. Well, she also likes strange food, so if she asks for something strange, you can put a cicada slow in the tapioca and she'll love it even more. Alice likes premium, sweet, and western foods. You could give her a dessert with precious ingredients, or you could take some cheaply made sashimi that sells for a hefty amount and just put cream in it, which adds western and sweet to it. It sounds disgusting, but she loves it. It should be noted that you can't just jam whatever you want into different recipes though. Some dishes explicitly forbid certain traits or can cancel certain traits out. Also, adding extra ingredients does not increase what people pay for it, so you should only bother if you are aiming for a perfect evaluation, or to sell them something expensive while hitting the desired traits. And on that matter, named characters will also sometimes use spell cards after each order they make. If you get a perfect evaluation, the spell card does something positive. If you got a bad evaluation, it will do something negative. Each character has their own unique spell cards. So while handling these special guests, you'll be trying to serve as many total guests as possible within the allotted time. And that sums up the izakaya portion of the day. So let's go over what made me sink more than 60 hours in climbing into this game. While I did enjoy the story and maxing out friendship levels with all the different characters, that alone probably would get boring quickly for me. Instead, what this game excels at is a consistent sense of progression across multiple systems. As you progress through the game, you can level up granting bonuses during izakaya mode. Gaining access to new areas gives you more shops and collection nodes for better ingredients. The game introduces a dynamic rhythm minigame to give you passive bonuses when cooking. You can upgrade your cooking stations in different izakayas. You can gain access to different assistants. Maxing out friendships gives passive bonuses, outfits, and new ingredient collection methods. Not to mention all the ingredients you gain. I think the best example I can give of this was early on in my playthrough when I would get characters asking for a premium dish. And early on, I didn't have anything premium to make. You start the game only knowing three dishes and barely any ingredients available. 
It wasn't uncommon for me to get bad evaluations from characters simply because it was impossible to please them. But then, you get access to more shops, more drinks, more ingredients, and a lot more dishes. Suddenly, I could always fulfill a character's request as long as I got creative. I started memorizing dishes that certain characters would always love, but it didn't end there. I kept gaining dishes. Some characters became not only easier to please, but now I was optimizing the amount of money I could drain from them. And for the record, the best way to do that is actually just with super expensive drinks. Um, especially with Marissa. She has way more money than she needs. But I was constantly improving Mystia's in-game capabilities alongside my own. And that's what made this game so addicting. So tempting that after saving the game at the end of the day, I often found myself continuing to play past the point I should have turned the game off. But I am not done singing its praises just yet. This game is very compatible with the actual Toho canon. It not only has accurate physical framing of Ginsokyo and a clear grasp on different characters, but it isn't afraid to delve into actual mythologies and histories behind them. If you've watched any of my content, you can probably understand why I like this. In Mystia's basement, you can change your outfit and standing sprites, go through music you've unlocked, rewatch completed story scenes, and even check out tons of fan art. Gameplay-wise, I also greatly appreciate the amount of quality of life that was placed into different parts of the game. Shortcuts for buying entire stacks of items, everything that the journal tracks for you, and most importantly, the search functionality for different dishes. The search functionality lets you filter dishes by one or more traits, which was absolutely necessary as you get more recipes. The game also reminds you if you have an active quest to serve a specific dish to someone when they show up at your izakaya. Also, I think that all of the footage in this video plainly shows just how good the art in this game is, both in its pixel art style and the level of detail and everything. But what I also need to point out is the soundtrack is equally fantastic. Each song is, of course, an arrangement from songs from the canon games. Better yet, when working at your izakaya, the music changes dynamically depending on how busy things are. The rhythm minigame likewise dynamically picks notes from the actual song playing at that time. I think this is something that people may not even notice, but it's such a great addition. And finally, the absolute best thing that I can say about this game. It is only $5. I would not be surprised to see a game of this quality asking for $20. This game is an absolute steal. Likewise, each DLC is only a couple of dollars more and adds to everything I spoke about. I do, however, have a couple of suggestions that I think the game might benefit from. The developers have done an amazing job continually improving everything about the game during and between new DLC releases, so I'll be including them all here. First, this game is very easy. While I believe this is an excellent decision for a calming, laid-back game, I think it would benefit from having an optional harder difficulty. For example, I never found myself having a customer run out of time to be served. Perhaps this threshold could be lowered. Maybe have the criteria to get a perfect evaluation with rare customers be harder. Conversely, they could be easier to piss off. Perhaps the amount of money needed for deadlines and expansions could be increased. Or perhaps this hard mode could simply be izakaya related and turned on and off at leisure. Later in the game, I found rare ingredients to be pretty common, while things like lamprey and trout were short in supply due to there being no consistent shop for them. You get to a point where money isn't really worth anything, so you can freely buy as many ingredients as you want without using time, except for a few ingredients that aren't sold anywhere. As a result, you end up never wanting to make those dishes despite Lamprey being Mystia's signature. The amount of ingredients like this has diminished as new DLC are introduced, so perhaps it's simply a matter of time until this is changed. While I love the recipe search tab, it isn't in alphabetical order. My guess is because it was originally in an order specific to the Chinese language, and they simply translated the buttons as they appeared. I think it would be worth changing that on the English branch of the game if possible. Finally, I have some suggestions with regard to story content. Without going into too much detail to avoid spoilers, considering most story challenges are repeatable, I would like the ability to redo the Kaguyamoko challenge to get both achievements and scenes. Lastly, despite Kyoko being what I would consider a very important character in regard to Mistia's motives, during the daytime when you can talk to people, she is only used for the tutorial. While you get to talk and build relations with other characters, she continues to only have this tutorial dialogue outside of story cutscenes. Part of me would like more personal interactions between her and Mistia. 
Even if none of these things actually make it into the game, I'll still look forward to anything that the developers decide to add. At the time of this video's release, the third DLC for Mystia Izakaya has been added with a translation surely on its way. If you were to ask me if this was a good fan game or a great fan game, I would say that not only is this a great fan game, it is a masterclass in how to create one. While there have been quite a few high quality fan games released in the past few years, I believe this one best exemplifies every quality a good fan game should try to include. I'll definitely be keeping an eye on anything the developers decide to work on after this. But that's all I have for now. Let me know if you'd like to see more fan game reviews in this style. And if you aren't already, consider subscribing for more Toho related content. As always, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.